Okay. Uh, so good afternoon. Uh, I'm Ann Ball. I'm program director at MDF, and I will let my my partner introduce herself. Bill V. P. K. Program director with MDF in the Maine Downtown Center. Great. So uh, we are here today to do one of our two board trainings we do a year. Uh, one of them is on uh, governance and, you know, mission, and it's done with Maine Association of Nonprofits, and that's typically in March or April, um, and that's really a, a broader look at working for a nonprofit. And today's board training is diving into a nonprofit that's a Main Street or an affiliate and a downtown organization and what is the approach that we use and what is your mission as a downtown organization. Um, and I'm just like thinking of everybody who's here. You are all nonprofits. Monson, are you still a committee uh, in the town? I think you are. Um, but this very much applies all of this to you guys as well. Um, I don't, I'm not going into kind of nonprofit stuff. I'm more talking about the approach, the Main Street approach. So um, this is really meant to be a collaborative and I would love it if you have questions, just, you know, put your camera on, take yourself off mute, whatever works, use the chat. Um, Sylvie and I can kind of tag team on that as well. Um, I really want this to not be uh, too painful. Um, and I don't, I think we will be through within an hour. Um, I think that's what Sylvia and I planned on. Okay. Are we ready to go? Um, just need to acknowledge who our funders are. I think it's for you guys to understand that, you know, the main downtown center is part of Maine development foundation, and we are a nonprofit um, organization. And these are uh, really our four superstar funders. Um, the Office of Community Development actually gives us money through HUD, Housing and Urban Development, federal money that comes to the state community development block grant program. And then they give money to us to uh, provide technical assistance statewide, in addition to supporting our main streets and affiliates. So those are the two big things we work on. And then um, we also want to thank Kenny Beck Savings Bank. And those of you that are helping me with the community, Sylvie Gardner, Augusta, uh, Hollowell, Freeport. Freeport, right. Did you say Brunswick? And Brunswick. Anybody who's in those communities, Kenny Beck Savings offers a participation stipend. And if you're interested in receiving that stipend and you didn't make a note of that on your registration, just pop your name and your email into the chat and we can follow up with you to make sure you get that stipend. We're really trying to lower the barrier so that, you know, if some of you are like, oh, I can't really cook dinner tonight. I got to get takeout because I'm attending this training or I need to hire a babysitter. So we're grateful to Kenny Beck Savings for working us with kind of lowering the, the barrier for you all to attend. And we'll work on getting it to other communities like uh, Saco and Monson. Um, but at the moment, we're working in Kenny Beck Savings Service area. So what we're going to cover, quick overview of MDF and the downtown center, and then dive into that four-point approach. And then I'm going to tell you about some of our kind of current happenings that we're doing. Um, and I updated the slides, you know, for you guys. So it's very current. Um, so MDF really is a nonpartisan statewide public private partnership organization and we really bring leaders together across all sorts of different sectors so we do leadership training um, we put out economic uh, research measures of growth in particular um, and we provide the legislature, the elected officials with research that they can use to make decisions. That's one of the original reasons MDF was founded actually, was because the um, legislature wanted someone outside of state government that could um, you know, help them make decisions, who was non-biased, non-partisan. And so that that's MDF. And then of course, uh, under programs and partnerships is the main downtown center um, and four main, which is our forest opportunity roadmap. Um, and we also do workforce projects um, like Main Spark. So we do a little bit of everything related to economic development in the state of Maine. 
Um, the downtown center kind of fits within a national structure. Uh, the National Trust for Historic Preservation founded uh, the, na the National Main Street Center over 40 years ago, which is also a nonprofit organization. And it started as like a demonstration project in response to malls. Like think of the 70s and the growth of strip malls and big shopping malls and drawing, you know, business and economy outside of our traditional downtowns all over the country. And so, you know, National Main Street Center was founded. Um, their their day-to-day -day name is Main Street America. And then they have coordinating programs all over the country. Um, and Main Downtown Center is Maine's coordinating program. So we are considered the state coordinator. And then in Maine, we have 10 nationally accredited main streets and 14 downtown affiliates right now. Uh, the main streets are full-time staff. Um, they are standalone nonprofit organizations and the affiliates are a combination of nonprofits um, like Friends of Woodford's Corner or housed in state government like a committee like the Monson Collaborative. Um, and then the uh, affiliates are mostly all volunteer run, but um, Heart of Ellsworth actually is operating with full-time staff, which is pretty amazing and, and unusual. Um, so I think I will move on. Here are the 10 nationally accredited main streets. And we actually, I, we just, well, I'll, I'll explain when we get there. 13 downtown affiliates. My other slide was wrong. I don't know if Monson Collaborative Sandra has a logo, but I should get it if you do. <laughs> um, and we have a new tier of membership, which is our municipal members. And Stonington and Bridgeton are our municipal members at this point. Um, and they do not have, uh, they have less requirements and they get less benefits of membership. They can't participate in getting that extra uh, CDBG bonus point. Like all those other communities get CDBG bonus points if they apply for downtown funding. Um, and they can't participate in uh, grant programs that we offer. Sometimes we have sub-grant money, which I'll talk about. Um, so they are getting technical assistance from us in a more intentional way, um, and they can participate in programs like you guys can. Um, this is our mission. I hate wordy slides. I'm sorry, but I do want you to read our mission and just take a look at that. And the part I always like is that at the core of our approach is a commitment to creating places of shared prosperity, equal access to opportunity and inclusive engagement. Our downtowns are really meant for all. Um, and uh, that is a picture of a sturgeon, which is a great public art project that Augusta did. I think it was installed, was it last year? Uh, JR and Clint, tell me, or was it the year before? I forget. It was the year before. The year before. Okay. So the third, this was, we're finishing the second year of the fish being up. Right. Correct. Yeah. And um, the Adirondack Chairs is a project in Brunswick. So the, the programs, the Main Streets and Affiliates are all over the country and the coordinating program. There are over 1,200 programs nationally. Um, it really is over 40-year-old approach to economic development. There are great metrics that we see coming out of the programs. Um, you guys that are Main Streets, uh, sir, whoops, hold on. That is my phone ringing into my headset. <laughs> um, hopefully you didn't hear that. <laughs> um, nope, we couldn't hear good. it. Good, that's good, in case it happens again. Um, so uh, the main streets have to collect reinvestment data. The affiliates collect some uh, other data metrics, like how many volunteer hours happen a year and things like that. But you're all implementing the same approach. And the interesting thing about the approach is the approach is that it works in a neighborhood program like Woodford's Corner, and it works in you know a, a city like Saco. So it really does work really well. It works in highly seasonal places, um, you know. 
I don't know if I consider Monson highly seasonal because you do have winter and summer, but I'm thinking of some of the island communities, like it works in those locations as well um, as the year round. So what we're gonna dive into is the Main Street approach. Um, like I said, please feel free to take yourself off mute if you have questions or raise your hand. We'll keep monitoring it as we dive into this. Um, I would love to know, is anybody, I know some of the SACO people do, but people who haven't been to this training before, like even your new board member in SACO, um, have you heard of the four points? Sandra's nodding. Yes, we have talked about it at all of our board meetings. Whoa, that's Friends great, Martha. Home. Yeah, it's part of, yeah, what uh, Teresa and talks Teresa about does constantly. It. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she is, yeah. She is pretty amazing volunteer leader that you have in Woodford's yeah, Corner. Yeah, she is. She is. So the four points, um, they are economic vitality, design, organization, and promotion. And we're going to go into what each of those are. But the big thing to understand about the four-point approach, and I'll say this a couple times, is they connect to what the community wants, what's their vision, and what the market will bear. Um, and they all are connected uh, through that. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't work uh, if you don't have all of that working in sync. And our main streets typically use the four points as a committee structure, meaning they have an organization committee and a promotion committee. And our affiliates are encouraged what we refer to as to touch the four points. So in the case of Monson, sorry to keep picking on you, Sandra, um, <laughs> you know, you guys might have an event committee that does puts on an event, but you might not have an economic vitality committee. But, you know, the your select board may say, well, what do you think we need for businesses in downtown Monson? And the Monson Collaborative might say, well, you know, this is the business type we need. We need things that will make people, you know, stay longer or another restaurant. You have an award-winning restaurant, but, you know, you may have other needs. Um, and your council may say, ask you that as like, you guys have this view of downtown. So um, those, it depends whether you're a Main Street or affiliate, but all of these four points are touched by all the work you're doing and we'll go into them. And as I said, um, you have to know what the community wants and you have to have an understanding of what the market is. And then you measure and you tell stories. So you get uh, quantitative and qualitative outcomes. Um, and transformation strategies is really kind of a, a theme and a way to structure your work. Um, I know SACO has said to me that they wanna work on their transformation strategy and that is great. And it is going to be a requirement of accreditation for Main Streets in 2024. So it's really important that SACO identify a transformation strategy. I'll use Skowhegan as an example. They have two transformation strategies. One is focusing on food systems and the other is focusing on the outdoor recreation economy. So the work they are doing it through the four points, and we'll get into how that works, um, is related to those two overarching transformation strategies. So I know that's a lot. Any questions? <laughs> I'll keep moving. Organization. So this is the one that um, people feel like is boring, you know, if you had to pick the, the, the least sexy of the four points, but it's actually really important. It's kind of like the basement of the house, right? It's what holds the organization together. It's about recruiting uh, volunteers, it's about having a, a fundraising strategy and it's about really good communication across all the work that you're doing between committees and volunteers and the municipality. Um, it, it really, like I said, volunteers, whether you have staff or not or how you get things done. Um, I think that's a Woodford's Corner in the lower left and Bath and I see Biddeford and Augusta in the upper left. And the interesting thing about the upper left Augusta is those are 
University of Maine Augusta students. So your volunteers come from people who live there, people who work there, people that are in school there. Um, and I think the Woodford's Corner group picture is a group that's been focusing on bike and pedestrian um, safety in Woodford's Corner. So it's it's pretty neat to think about all the places you can get volunteers. And the Bitterford one, those are students too. I forgot those are UNE students. So volunteers are a big part of that uh, organization committee. And they have, a lot of our organizations have the organization serve as their executive committee, right? If you are a traditional board of 501c3, that's a great way for your officers to meet monthly um, and really make decisions and oversee the budget and your programming and all the things it takes to operate your organization. Um, the second point I'm going to talk about is economic vitality, and this is really about the businesses and the business mix and really recruiting businesses. I remember years ago, Belfast was like, we need an Indian restaurant in Belfast, and the director literally wrote to Indian restaurants around the state of Maine and said, don't you want to open a second, second restaurant? Um, I don't know that they were successful. It wasn't like a big economic strategy like you'd get, you know, partnering with your economic development department at your municipality, but it was creative. Um, and I know other communities have done specific recruitment strategies. Uh, years ago, Bitterford said, we need more restaurants. It's hard to imagine that that's the story today because they have so many restaurants, um, but they did. They said, we're going to actually have a prize and they offered like a competitive process for a business to relocate in Biddeford. Uh, and they obviously have recruited businesses. And now they say, we don't need more restaurants, we need more retail. So, you know, it's all about what you might need. Um, and it's communicating with those businesses. And really, a lot of our programs have um, monthly um, I think there's Morning on Main, uh, the Business Barometer that's in Bath, where they get the businesses together just to say, hey, how's everybody doing? Sometimes they have presentations. Sometimes it's just sharing and networking. But that's what economic vitality is. Uh, certainly, this took a specific role during COVID. Um, that photograph is actually in Rockland, and the municipality really helped with putting up the fire pits. Um, putting up the barriers so that there was more outside space in the community. So it, it's lots of ways that our Main Streets and affiliates work with their businesses and help their businesses. And uh, promotion, um, really talking about uh, the social value and events and festivals, and you all do this. And it really, there's such wonderful place-based events and people, love what all of you do. I mean, it's really kind of amazing, but it's also looking at like an overall marketing strategy. Um, our 10 main streets work together to do a collaborative marketing campaign called Main Street Maine. And it is um, a website that's really meant for travelers and visitors. And it originally received funding from the Office of Tourism. But it's hard for an individual Main Street to say, we're going to be a tourism Main Street, but together as 10 of them, they tell an amazing story about historic downtowns and place and why you want to come to Maine. So um, the promotion piece can take lots of different forms. Uh, specific events, the Skowhegan Craft Brew Festival has become a really big signature event for them. Um, a Holton uh, I can't remember if this is, I know it's fireworks, but I don't think it's 4th of July. I think it's like a homecoming or something that they do. Um, anyway, amazing. Look how many people are in that square, right? These are big events. And then think about small things, downtown farmers markets. Um, this is in Lisbon and uh, they, they closed the street and painted um, the street during COVID to bring the farmer's market downtown to support the businesses, but also to create events. And they don't have to be big. They can be really simple. I forget where this chalk party was, but um, Belfast did a chalk party recently too. And it can be simple. They don't have to be big events. It's really just about getting people into your community and uh, connecting socially. And design. Thinking about good design, 
and all the things that make your downtowns um, navigable from signage, uh, wayfinding to trail systems, uh, keeping the storefronts clean and encouraging property owners to do beautiful displays in their windows. And then working with your municipality on like, whoa, that crosswalk light isn't the right timing anymore. You know, cars are backing up. We'll let the municipality know so they can fix it. Or we really need a crosswalk here. Um, there's so much in this space. Uh, it's one of my favorite of the four points. I will confess, um, this is a simple project in downtown Gardner. So the Gardner runs along the Cabasi River as well as the Kennebec River. And they um, have sturgeon and they, what's the other fish? Okay, Augusta people, what's the other fish that runs in the river right there? Anybody know? Okay, anyway, <laughs> those are fishing rods with painted fish that the school children did to celebrate run of the Cabasi with the fish that I can't remember. Um, and they put them all over downtown. They come out every year and look how low budget that is. It's like the plastic bucket, a bunch of rocks and then some mulch, but really cute and engaged the community. And then um, the mill picture with the green bridge, that's a much larger infrastructure project that was um, because it's crossing a body of water, it's probably federal money, but it is going across to the mill, across the Presumpscot River. And I put it out there because of the slide up for you, because a lot of effort went into the design of that bridge. It's wood, it's wooden, first of all, the structure is metal, but the, the platform is wood and the color green, two types of fencing, one so you can still see the more old design, but then the kind of safe designed green fence lowered so that you know children aren't falling into the river. Um, and then that upper right hand design feature, that is a bike rack or a stroller rack or whatever in downtown Norway. Um, but I show it because it has their logo on it. It's really simple. The municipality was gonna put those in anyway and the Norway downtown said, why don't we, you know, lighten it up a little bit and make it really connect to our place? Uh, Placemaking, um, downtown Hollowell on the left there, they did what's called a demonstration project. They had like a old uh, kind of parking area right on Water Street. It was kind of unsightly and they wanted to make a park out of it. And I don't think the elected officials were ready to bite off the price tag of it. And they said, well, can we just put one up temporarily? So they got the green fake grass and they got trees from uh, the landscaping company and the picnic table and the chairs and the man with his dog. And, you know, they put it up for two or three weeks and they talked to people and they really thought about like, does this make sense? Um, and I know it hasn't happened yet because I looked at this space just the other day, but I hope someday it will become a permanent park. My understanding was, is that it would, but, um, and I think then they're the other pushing it along. I think it's they are forward. pushing it along. Thank I think you, so. Sally. Okay. <laughs> we have hope because uh, at the moment it's just a little dirt place and not that attractive, but they really did have a lot of use when they did this, you know, demonstration project. And then the other two slides, um, the one at the top right is a brand new space in downtown Westbrook, which is really excited. It's called Westbrook Commons and they're using it for a farmer's market. They're using it for um, entertainment. Um, and this is actually a you know play on a Saturday um, with all the hula hoops and I don't know what the other vendors are, but um, it's a brand new space. And they had the, the municipality had a, a competition from, or I guess it was an RFP for, you know, landscape firms. And it, it's really exciting to see what's happening with a new space on a main street. Um, and the, obviously the Halloween one is just a timely picture of communities building out their downtowns um, seasonally. Um, murals and art, um, this is in Ellsworth. 
Um, what I love is that before they did the mural on the left, they put up the giant sticky note and it just sat there for a number of months until the artists could come do the work, which is on the right. So really just a lot you can do um, in design. Um, the committee structure, as I said, really like our main streets often have four committees, um, but we are also flexible if, um, you know, with our affiliates, we want them to think about this stuff when they have conversations about, you know, you find out, I mean, Woodford's Corner just lived through a huge DOT project a couple years ago. And you really have to think about that. First of all, what's the design of the road? Where are the crosswalks gonna be? Is there space for public art or planting? And how is the construction gonna impact our businesses? So just in that one project I mentioned, they touched all four points, didn't they? So you gotta think about it. That's kind of your role and your purpose um, as an organization. So I thought I'd touch base on historic preservation for a little bit. Um, we often think about historic preservation uh, as buildings, which it is, um, but I'm also going to reflect a few minutes on cultural preservation. Um, but out of the gate, this is in Brunswick. It's uh, the Lamont Hall, and it's a brand new historic tax credit project that um, we had a tour of during our annual conference. Um, and historic preservation work is part of your mission. You guys are all in historic downtowns. You have historic buildings individually. Some of you have historic districts. Some of you have national register properties or national register districts. And some of you have like individual buildings listed. So um, they're all kind of part of what you're doing. Um, there is a new historic district in downtown Brunswick um, with 34 structures. It's a good sized structure. They're one of our main streets, the Brunswick Downtown Association. And then in Dover Foxcroft, um, they have a brand new historic district um, with 19 buildings, including the uh, center theater right there, which is really exciting. The historic district, it's a national designation. So that's nice. It, a national register district doesn't protect these properties. So that's the big misnomer. A lot of people say, oh, you're gonna tell me what color I can paint my building, but that's not what the national register does. It really has two purposes. One is it serves as a trigger if there's federal dollars involved. If it's federal highway or it's HUD, there's some kind of federal dollars involved. There's like a checks and balances. It goes to the National Park Service and says, are there any historic structures or archeological resources or landscapes that we need to be aware of as we do this federal project? And that's, that's a really great checks and balances. So the, it does that. And then the other thing the National Register does is it allows access to historic tax credit, credits. So if you're a developer and you want to renovate a building in Maine, we have state historic tax credits and we are have access to federal historic tax credits. So you can get a tax break on up to 40% of your taxes on a, on a building project. Um, and a lot of our communities have had historic tax credits um, projects completed. It absolutely, there's data about it driving economic development. So those are the two big reasons about why historic districts, national historic districts are so important. Um, and then Augusta, actually in 2017 took it a step further. They they actually designated their downtown uh, district as a local historic district. And that is where the protection comes. And that is where you tell, help people say, actually, you know, you can't put vinyl siding on that building. You should, um, you know, restore that window rather than replace it with a vinyl window. Um, and, you know, here's photographs for how to do that. Here's uh, technical people that can do that work for you. So uh, Augusta has a local historic district. And then in their municipality, they have what's called a, a historic district commission. And so if you own one of these properties and you want to do work on it, you go before the commission. Um, and it is meant to be a collaborative process. Um, and I think 
gosh, I'm trying to remember how many CLGs we have in Maine. We have 11 in Maine, including four Main Streets communities, Augusta, Gardner, Saco, and Biddeford, all have local historic districts. Any questions? I know this is kind of technical. Okay. So uh, Skowhegan, um, this is the old spinning mill and this is the historic tax credit in progress. It uh, was bought by Bigelow Brewing um, and they uh, got the property, um, the process of using tax credits underway. And it is going to be a brewery on the first floor with um, I think maybe I can't remember the exact, it's a whole mixed use development, including the brewery, a tasting room, some other retail, and then housing um, on probably the third and fourth floor. And it's, you know, a multi-year project. It's gonna take a while, but um, they are, Bigelow Brewing has been working hard. Uh, they actually sold the property to a developer. They realized this is, you know, a lot to undertake doing a tax credit project, um, but they they got the ones off, they got this off the ground. They were the ones who secured the title in the first place and developed the plans for rehabilitation. So this is an exciting gateway project for the town of Skowhegan. Um, I told you I hate words, a lot of wordy slides, but I do want you to see a little of the economic impact money from historic tax credits. Um, so, 17 million in new property tax revenue um, in the state of Maine since 2010. So it's, uh, it's a very powerful program. Um, National Park Service, uh, they have the Paul Brune Historic Preservation Fund. And we are not a grant making organization typically, but they were running what's called a sub grant program. And we were like, well, we should apply. So we have applied twice in 2019 and 2021. Um, and each time we got the largest award in the country, which is very exciting. And we had bricks and mortar preservation funding. And that is pretty unusual in Maine. There's never enough money for taking care of these amazing historic buildings. So in 2020, these were our grantees. Um, one of the requirements was that these were projects that would drive economic development. That's the other reason why we applied. We were like, no one is better suited for this. So we partnered with Maine Historic Preservation Commission, who is our regulatory partner, and ourselves as the economic development professionals. And we said communities had to be in um, a downtown affiliate or a Main Street. Um, and the only community that unfortunately was eliminated because of population size was Woodford's Corner, which is sad, Martha. Um, but because <laughs> it's part of Portland, they said mm -hmm. that was too big. Um, so uh, we applied again in 2022. Uh, we applied in 2021 and these were our grantees. Um, so pretty exciting work and we will be applying again um, in the future. Uh, I think we run a good tight program and hopefully the National Park Service will give us an award again. So um, a preservation ethic, um, I guess I just wanted to, like I said, briefly talk about preservation of culture and preservation of buildings. Um, you know, this is, these three photos all happen to be from Norway. Um, and they really are a community that has kind of a culture of historic preservation, um, mostly related to their buildings. But um, just a few weeks ago, at the end of September, we were actually in an old snowshoe factory that is being renovated to be, um, it's called Lights Out Theater. Sylvie, is that what it's called? Lights Out, because they're a kind of all around art center. Okay, thank you. So it's like dance and theater and all sorts of stuff, but it had this huge history of snowshoeing in downtown Norway. So this factory made snowshoes. And then we know that downtown Norway has a snowshoe festival. And then their land trust um, has uh, a snowshoe race and they have attached their trail system to the downtown. So people can actually go to the land trust and like snowshoe to the downtown 
go out to eat and then like, or walk around and then snowshoe back. So there is this kind of culture of like winter snowshoeing, which is really interesting. And I love how that's starting to become a story in Norway, in addition to the fact that they take really good care of their historic buildings, that Norway Opera House, um, that building was falling down and the municipality actually took it. They took it by eminent domain and they helped, you know, said we need a nonprofit and we need all these things to be able to get it done. And so the municipality saved that building. So they deserve kudos for that. Um, and I just think the other white building is the McLaughlin Gardens, which is actually in uh, Paris, which is the town next door. But that is a very traditional vernacular farmhouse with one of the mm. largest lilac connections in the country. Mm. And it's in Paris. So I highly recommend you go visit, but I also, again, just say that there is a culture of preservation in this area. If there's a project coming into the town, um, the municipality calls up Norway downtown, an all volunteer organization and says, what do you think of the plans? You know, they still have a planning board and certainly, you know, a, a process, but they seek out their opinion and they have some pretty amazing people um, on Norway downtown. Um, downtown theaters, uh, Johnson Hall in Gardner, multi-year project. Um, they're going to be opening in March, I think. Um, they use tax credits and they're a nonprofit. So you're like, wait, how can they do that? Well, they used a developer, Developers Collaborative, as a third party to use the historic tax credits. And this is the way the Norway Opera House and the Colonial Theater are being done. I think the Colonial Theater is using third-party tax credits. Correct me if I'm wrong, JR or Clint. Um, so what it means is the developer comes in and runs the project and they actually take ownership of the building. Um, I think it's for five years and they get to reap the benefits of the tax break and then they sell it back to the nonprofit for a dollar. It's a little bit of a workaround, but it is so, uh, it is something that works and we're seeing people using it um, all over Maine. Um, so historic theaters, bottom line is they provide one of a kind experiences um, in the state of Maine and we're lucky to have them, uh, especially we have our libraries, um, that's Bath, Gardner, um, what's the third one? Oh, PV Library in Eastport. I mean, look at those buildings. Those are right downtown, all three of those buildings. They're really special parts of our downtowns. Um, and they also provide education and have Wi-Fi. I mean, they are really beloved buildings and places, I guess I would say. Uh, working waterfronts, I just wanna talk about a couple of those for a minute. Uh, Rockland and Stonington in particular, we, we actually did a session a few weeks ago with Maine Coast Fishermen's Association and really talked about, um, it was held in Belfast and it was a wonderful evening event just talking about these places and how do you continue to support a working waterfront? Is that through land use, encouraging traditional waterfront uses? Um, can you support and cultivate waterfront entrepreneurs, uh, whether it's, you know, seafood economy? Um, and what is that culture of a working waterfront? I mean, I, I think, you know, Sandra, I think of Monson and the incredible hiking culture um, that comes with being at the foot of the 100 mile wilderness. What a culture. <laughs> so um, you all have these stories to tell. And I guess, like I said, when I talk about preservation, I just wanna think about the stories and more beyond just the buildings. Um, great quote, I think, um, and also a great publication. And you guys will get a copy of these slides, but I encourage you to uh, take this, download this publication. Uh, it gives these reasons, 24 of them, uh, for why preservation is good for your community. Um, but it really, it, it is really what you're all about. And then preservation is economic development. We know that there are metrics uh, nationally, um, and I shared the tax credits, but we know that when people travel, 
they want to visit historic places with texture and grit and interesting places to um, you know, see and with things to do. So um, preservation absolutely drives economic development. It's my last wordy slide, I, I swear. Um, this is really reflecting on some of the metrics of the Main Street program that you guys are all part of. So um, really 285,000 buildings have been rehabilitated, 640,000 new net jobs and uh, nearly 144,000 net new businesses. So that's the work you're doing and uh, you were tracking it, National is tracking it, like we all get this information and it's real. So that is the four point approach. I'm just gonna pause for a second, see how everybody's doing and double check my watch. Everybody, anybody have right. anything? Who's speaking, Sylvie? Martha? It wasn't me, might have okay. been some background noise. Okay, great. Any questions? Okay, quiet group, that's no problem. Well, I want you to know the people sitting in the lawn chairs are the main downtown center advisory council. So we don't have uh, MDF, the mothership has a board of directors, but the downtown center has an advisory council. Uh, 15 people, including two main street directors, including an affiliate, and then everybody else is uh, works for state agencies, is um, volunteers in a main street, engineers, planners, architects, all the stuff about the work you do, uh, bankers, DOT, Main Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, they're amazing. They do, they guide a lot of the work that Sylvie and I do, um, and. Anyway, I thought I'd give them a little shout out so you know how we do our work. Um, we ha have taken our downtown work and we work across our silos at MDF. MDF, um, the four main program stands for Forest Opportunity Roadmap. Uh, the EDA, the Economic Development Administration declared Maine a federal economic disaster area within a span of a few years, like 10 mills, traditional paper mills closed. And so um, we received money to work with those 10 communities and they worked with technically redeveloping those mills and figuring out what was their next life going to be. They also worked on broadband. They also worked on housing. And then their third body of work was the downtown. So we uh, went to see six of the 10 communities opted in to say, yeah, we want to look at our downtown. So we've been helping uh, the communities of Ashland, East Millinocket, Millinocket, Bucksport, Old Town, Lincoln, trying to think, I think that might be all of them, looking at their downtown as an asset for revitalization of their communities. So that's a body of work. And then I want to mention Jane's Walk, which is, do you guys hear my dog? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Busy oh. afternoon at my house. <laughs> um, so Jane's Walk is a new partnership that is between uh, Friends of Congress Square Park in Portland, Portland Downtown District, Greater Portland Landmarks, Maine Preservation, and the Maine Downtown Center. And Jane's Walk is an international event based on Jane Jacobs, who was um, an urbanist who started walking her streets and walking her neighborhoods and just started looking around and realizing about all these special places and quirks and began leading Jane's Walks. And like I said, it's an international event. It's always held the first Saturday in May. I gotta get the 20, I don't know why I just realized it's two years old. I gotta get the right graphic, sorry about that. But I last year went on a Jane's Walk cause we kind of divide ourselves on this one Saturday. And I went to New Auburn, Maine. It was, it's a neighborhood of Auburn, Maine. And uh, these were my three guides with the group I was on. It, it was amazing just learning about 
um, the Irish immigrants that came in and were working in the mills and where they lived and where they went to church and where they went to school and early businesses. It was a great walking tour and a part of Maine I had never spent time in. So Jane's walks are really fun. Um, I'm trying to think. I think there was one in Woodford's Corner. Didn't you go to it? Sophie? Yes, I did. It was Jeff, a big one. Jeff Levine. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I encourage you all to do a Jane's Walk. Um, it's free and you get swag so that you can be a tour guide and it can be on anything. It does not have to be on buildings or neighborhoods or urban design. It can be on like gargoyles or there was a tour in Portland that was on like early LGBTQ like nightclubs. I mean, just fascinating. And then one was on gargoyles, like look up in the Portland buildings and there were all these gargoyles. So um, all sorts of fun topics and uh, we'll be putting out our information like we always do, but um, just wanted to give a shout out to that our entrepreneur ecosystem work, which many of you have been participating in. Um, this is really looking at business support systems. And we were originally funded for the pilots through Maine Community Foundation to do the work in Monson, Skowhegan, and Lisbon. And then we decided to uh, replicate the work and we're now working in uh, nine additional sites. Um, and one site includes Saco and Biddeford together. But they're looking at ways to support the entrepreneurs that are there, way to make it really easy for someone to start a new business. Augusta's working a lot with youth and in particular going to build out like an entrepreneur center in the Boys and Girls Club right downtown. So each community is getting planning money and implementation money, plus lots of consulting. Um, so about $60,000 in cash and then maybe another $20,000 in consulting fees. So it's it's really great body of work and we're excited to be working with all of the regional economic development directors and our state partners from the SBA and FAME and help me out, Sylvie, who are all our partners? <laughs> DECD, Department of Economic Community Development, yeah. um, USM, some actually with their That's right. BIPOC yeah. so focus work. It's really cool work that um, we'll be wrapping up in March. Um, so that's a big body of work for us. Um, the implementation, I just guess I forgot to show you the slide. That's our consultant, Matt Wagner, up in Holton, who's one of our communities. Um, and then, of course, um, the Moxie uh, Parade. Um, showing a little bit about implementation there. Uh, they opened, and Sylvie, why don't you tell everybody, because you went to the ribbon cutting last week of, of their implementation project. That's right. They had some a couple iterations because they were, you know, moving forward with in one direction. And then, you know, of course, building ownership would change or, you know, someone's vision would change, but they um, were just opening a really an art center, I'll call it, but it's it's a group of artists and it's a nonprofit that they have formed um, and it represents, it's an opportunity for artists or makers to sell their work in a storefront right on the main street in downtown. And um, right now they are all just volunteer nonprofit run to keep this um, store open um, and manage the different makers who either live or work in Monson or excuse me in Lisbon and um it's they did a really fabulous job of building out the space and it, there was a great turnout for the ribbon cutting uh with some cool. yeah municipal as well as uh, staff as well as elected officials and community members um and this was in a space that there had been a long tradition of a kind of a craft store so kind of this you know yeah institutional um spot for artists in the community and um, that owner of the business was moving on and so it ended up being a really um really thoughtful handoff and it was one of the things that came out of their entrepreneur ecosystem audit it said we have lots of artists we have lots of makers but they don't have a place to come together and sell um together and create together um so i think that was kind of the impetus for the creation of this Lisbon Arts Collective. So each project that's being done in the communities really relates to what their findings were. Um, uh, and then other work that we're doing, uh, we're 
thinking about youth engagement, we're thinking about diversity, equity, inclusion, both at the MDF level and um, ourselves, and then within helping our communities. Um, we're constantly deep coaching with communities that need a little extra help. As I said, I'm gonna be participating with Augusta Downtown Alliance because they're gonna be searching for a new director. Um, we always provide scholarships to trainings. So if any of you, see something. Unfortunately, it's not for the National Main Street Center Conference, but for another training that you're like, oh, I really want to go and I'm a volunteer with this downtown group. Well, just reach out because we can uh, give you a scholarship. I mean, in Saco, we helped pay the new directors half of her grant writing class. Um, and then, you know, I think Christina Cannon in Skowhegan has a couple times wanted to attend an economic development meeting that might not have been in her budget. So um, we will work with you. We usually share the cost because um, we that's just our model so that it's a, a, a shared um, sort of intent. Um, and then we're always looking for funding for our local programs and communities. As I mentioned, the National Park Service funding, uh, we did just receive a big grant from the main office of tourism um, that's specifically for working. In this case, it's for our main streets. It's not for our affiliates, but we are always looking for more funding that we can pass through or share with you. Um, Maine should be really proud because we have had what are called GAMSA winners. We've had two. Bath in 2012 was named a Great American Main Street. This is a really crazy big deal. In New England, um, no other New England state has, they either have zero or one. So we have two now. We're very excited. And our second one is Bitterford. Um, it takes a lot to do this, but it's quite something. Um, and it really shows how deep the work goes in the community. Um, and it, it's just quite an honor. Um, I really feel like the work that you guys do is helping to define your places. Um, and, you know, people talk about the health of the community, the heart of the community. I really think that is all of you and all the work you are doing. So I do want to thank you for coming tonight and thank you for everything you're doing for your downtown organizations. And the Main Street Conference is going to be in Alabama. Um, we Last year it was in Boston and we had over 60 people attend from Maine. I don't know that we can do that for Alabama because it's way more expensive for all of us, but um, it is happening. And we love to have... Um, there's so much for you to learn. So please consider if it works and it interests you. Um, and that is the end of our presentation. And I will just see if anybody has any questions before you head on your way tonight. Um, no questions, but that was very, it was a great overview. Ah, uh, thanks. Really Martha. enjoyed <laughs> learning about everything that you're doing. It's really impressive. Um, well, thank you for yeah. all that you you are doing. And uh, like I said, mm. Teresa is one of our superstars. She actually was given an award um, at our annual conference, as I'm sure you yeah. know. She's well deserved. Yeah. yeah, well deserved. Well, she's she's a powerhouse. Saw, yeah. Look at that whole Saco crowd eating pizza. Is there a little baby in there? Is there a little baby? Yeah, Somebody there has is. to tell me. <laughs> there uh, is a little baby. Hi, little baby. Oh, oh, oh. So fun. Okay. That made my night. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we have a baby and we have um all three of our new board members. Jim, That's great. Uh, Julie, Welcome. and Wendy. <laughs> Welcome, Saco Main Street new board members. Thank you for taking the time tonight to do this. Totally appreciate it. And I hope like your, whatever Holly called it, your pizza reveal party. I, like I said, I, I, think party. Party. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think you could do better, but uh, on the topic. Um, but anyway, <laughs> super nice of all of you to come. Um, and Wendy also from Saco. So thank you. Clint, thanks for making it. And Sandra. Thank Keep you very much. Good work in Monson and just let us know what you guys need. Um, we'll send, you know, a slide deck to you. Um, you can pull things out to share with your boards or your committees. Um, and we have the recording available too. 
Uh, I guess I can stop that, right? It's just about to.